Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my apologies. Our guest speaker for today, because of some extenuating circumstances, wouldn't be able to join us. But the director of the organization Growing North will be giving the presentation to you and replacing him. Uh, but the bio I have is for uh, Benjamin Canning, and I will actually give you a brief snapshot. Benjamin Canning is an avid social entrepreneur co-founding Growing North, a nonprofit that addresses food insecurity in Canada's far north, a non uh, and co-founding Project Pura, an international water sanitation initiative. His personal mission is to bring about positive systemic change through the use of social entrepreneurship, commerce, and green technology. Driven by his passion to solve global systemic issues and create a better world for tomorrow, Benjamin is, ex uh, is excited to be attending Waterloo, or he was planning to attend Waterloo as a guest speaker with WISE, but now Monica, the director of Growing North, uh, will be representing this organization and giving some detailed initiatives in the Canadian architect. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Monica. <laughs> Well, I'm very sorry about um, that Ben isn't actually in this room at the moment, but uh, basically Ben and Stephanie Nieto um, started this organization Growing North in 2013, and um, their objective is to solve and to alleviate food insecurity in Canada's north. So our first pro uh, pilot project was in Now Yet Nunavut, and um, our objective overall was to kind of build this geodesic uh, dome by partnering with the local community, which is um, Inuit, and working with the community through education, um, building kind of a local food system with the community to kind of bring back food into the community. As we know that it's a fly-in um, area, so basically everything is brought into the community through, um, and it's a lot of packaging, everything's bought through the grocery store, and um, yeah. <laughs> So, in Northern Canada is facing a food crisis. Food insecurity, the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable nutrition food. That is our definition of food insecurity. That is the whole purpose of Growing North, is up north there is an epidemic of food insecurity. And as Canadians, we as an organization really believe that this is a really systematic public health issue. If Canada were 100 people, only eight of them would be food insecure. But if none of it were 100 people, 68 of them would be food insecure. Everyone thinks of our country as a place with an abundance of resources and opportunity. But Canadians, just like me and you, across our country are, su are subject to poverty, food insecurity, and in inequality. Come with us to Now Yet Nunavut, an isolated town of 1,200 Inuit Canadians located on the Arctic Circle. Temperatures average below minus 30 degrees Celsius, making food nearly impossible to grow. Food is four to five times more expensive in the north compared to the rest of Canada. Oh, I don't think you could hear it. Skip <laughs> so the way Growing North approaches this issue is that we conducted a needs assessment um, through in-depth interviews, focus groups, and questionnaires. We discovered three primary concerns. Number one, we have a lack of economic opportunity. 77 of the community is unemployed. This leads directly to high food insecurity. Four in five households in Naya do not have access to affordable food. And when children um, go to school, a lot of them face low graduation rates as well. So we created a solution, a low impact development project to identify this issue in partnership with our local partners and stakeholders. Growing North is designed to address food insecurity, low graduation rates and unemployment through one solution. Technology, operational needs and sustainability. 
So introducing the Green Igloo, a journey that has taken us three years to complete. In October 2015, in the middle of the Arctic tundra, we built a greenhouse. A greenhouse that not only addressed food insecurity, oops, food insecurity, but brought together an entire community. The real question is, will it work? The answer is yes, it has worked. <laughs> the geodesic greenhouse dome can withstand wind up to 180 kilometers per hour and up to seven feet of snow. It is energy efficient, has less than 40% surface area than a regular greenhouse, and with just three hours of sunlight, the dome can heat itself 30 degrees warmer than external conditions. So this is our, the dome that is currently present in now yet none of it. And our technology model, so we use agrotechnology, so approximately 300 hydroponic towers, um, zip grow towers. Um, and we grow everything from tomatoes, uh, spinach, lettuce, um, onions, and not only from the hydroponic towers, but we also have um, growing beds as well in, situated in the greenhouse. And at the moment, we are exploring sustainable energy options. So right now, we just currently use electricity, and we are not growing all year round. And what we'd ideally like to do is to consider um, innovative and green technologies in um, our greenhouses as we are planning to expand. So this is no ordinary greenhouse. We've combined three different technologies into one working unit. Um, during the summer, the greenhouse can heat itself 30 degrees warmer than external conditions, um, and the north-facing wall is outfitted with a reflective barrier. So these are the hydroponic towers that, are current, that we currently use, and there's about 300 of them. So in 2017, um, this is the amount of money that we've raised through grants and external stakeholders. Um, so recently we have been a part of the Google Impact Challenge and we are one of the top 10 finalists out of Canada. And in addition to that, we've gotten corporate grants as well from Lush as well as um, a lot of help from Ryerson University. So our operational model puts our key stakeholders right in the, in the action. The community, we hire and train local people through a co-op program, which is um, situated in the high school, and teaching them how to manage the greenhouse and harvest. Food is then brought to mar market in any of three ways. So from our farmer's market to the hamlet distribution and sold or sold directly to grocery, grocers. And just an overview of our cooperative program, um, I personally work really close with that one. So basically we understand and we realize that um, some of the things that we are growing aren't considered culturally appropriate food. So we ensure that we work with the community to know what they want to grow and to share resources on how to grow it, teaching them, you know, because agrotechnology is even fairly new to us and just sharing that knowledge, working with the community at their pace. And since the greenhouse is located right next to the school, it is really easy for us to drop by and really just work with the community when we go up north. Okay, back to education. Um, so we created an educational program that can be implemented into the local schools where students can learn about horticulture, business, and the operations, as well as nutrition. Students learn the science behind the growing and understand the methods. We have had students grow through this program and plant an assortment of fresh produce that grew in the greenhouse in their community. In addition to that, we've actually managed to hire two people this summer to work in the greenhouse that graduated from this cooperative program. And these are just a list of the things that we currently grow at the moment. 
So currently we have two greenhouse managers, as I just mentioned, who have gone through the program and now have the skills to grow enough food to feed 613 people from now yet. The nutritional requirement of produce for an Inuit diet. On top of this, we can sell the food at 51 to 70 percent reduction per pound of food. Here's what it means to Darren, a recent grad from the program and current greenhouse manager. Well, the volume. <laughs> So here is our team um, that, <laughs> that are part of our, and as well as our board of advisors. So this, our team, so this is also the team up north, and we're headquartered in Toronto, as well as our advisors are um, from Toronto. So with each greenhouse we implement, we aim for these benchmarks, increasing employment locally by five to seven jobs, so two full-time, minimum three-time positions, increasing the local graduation rate by 20% by offering hands-on and experimental learning to supplement the current curriculum. Lastly, increasing food insecurity by 53% where we operate. So with the exposure, the Elder Council of Arbyat, another Inuit community, has invited us to help reduce their level of food insecurity. We will be conducting our needs assessment and replicating our Now Yet model this summer, ensuring economic and operational sustainability. By 2019, we are, expand, we are planning to expand to, I have a very hard time with this name, Kougarut. <laughs> it's K-U-G-A-A-R-U-K. Very hard time with my Inuit names. Oh, sorry. So this is an overview of a timeline of when we have started and where we're at at the moment. So as of now, we are currently seeking to further expand um, into other communities. So at the moment, we are this summer, we are conducting our needs assessment with Arbiat. And ideally, we are trying to now um, build two greenhouse domes in a kind of eco park. Um, in addition to that, with now yet, our objective is to grow all year round. So seeking that green technology, reducing our costs is the main problem with that. Oh, okay. Um, and then these, this is how we have implemented this greenhouse dome and how it's, um, how we have actually managed to keep it successful and keep it running since 2014. And as you can see, electricity is kind of the costly um, factor in this project that we really are aiming to explore. Okay. And then this is an overview of our electrical usage. Um, so as you can see, pumps, units four, kilowatts per hour is 23.6. So right now we are exploring um, Arctic wind turbines particularly, and we have um, been contacted regarding solar panels, but at the moment, we are, we are pretty adaptable, we're pretty flexible. <laughs> um, okay. So on the inside, we'll be incorporating vertical hydroponic towers. So this overview is to increase production two to three times over traditional methods. And the hydroponic towers were designed for live sales and marketing, meaning we don't have to stop growing when we extract the produce, so it just keeps on harvesting. Um, and one tower is approximately five feet tall. So once again, this is an overview on how we've managed to um, continue this project successfully. So our elk cap capacity is about 13,000 pounds of produce per year. Um, and our focus at the moment is northern Canada, particularly the Arctic. Um, and our growing method is primarily agrotechnology along with this geodesic dome and hydroponic towers. Um, and it costs per system approximately 80,000. And that is the end. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so this is awesome. And I think what you guys are doing is really fantastic and addressing a really important need. Um, well, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about sort of the, the yearly costs that you have and some more about the sort of financial sustainability about something so do you have like a rundown of, so the capital cost is one thing, mm -hmm. but operational cost versus the value of the food that you produce every year or that you think you would be able to produce every year? 
So you're asking more so, so our operational cost. Yeah, versus the value of the, for the food that you're actually producing, right? To be honest, I'm not the right person to uh, answer that. I'm not. I'm more. I'm not so much on the business side. I'm more on the environmental side. But to my understanding, um, I mean, I can't, I can't remember which slide it was, but. Like my question is, in order, and you can, you don't have to answer it, but it might just be an interesting thing to think about. But how much would your food have to cost in order to cover the operational costs? Oh, okay. Yeah, so right now we are, at, at this very moment, we are trying to collaborate with, um, have you heard of the Northern Store? So it's a grocery store up there, and it's one of the very, very few grocery stores up there to kind of do a price reduction. And at the moment, it's, um, it's, it's a bit of a, so right now we're trying to go more so with the farmer's market and, um, you know, like a good food box program. Um, so we have one of those in Toronto through Food Share. So yeah, so basically kind of doing a good food box program, but just primarily just working directly with the community because with the Northern store, it's a bit more, it's a bit more problematic at the moment because they, they, with the price reduction. <laughs> and um, So how are you setting your prices? Like how are you deciding? Well, actually right now we, so since our first harvest was last in the fall, so basically what we did, because we wanted to integrate the community into this, you know, stuff like kale and spinach, we were handing it out for free and we were just, our objective was really just getting them involved with this greenhouse. Right. So at the moment, that's what we're exploring. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys have the sort of plan to try to get to a point of like financial sustainability of the project? So once, once it's built, obviously, you've got that upfront cost. Mm -hmm. It is what it is and you've got some grant money to cover that. But do you want to sort of get to the point where you can have these operating where they're sort of making enough money that they, they're covering their operational costs? Yeah. Like plan. To my knowledge that there is a sustainable revenue model that um, some other members have created. Um, and ideally, like, at the moment, um, our entire team is volunteer based except for the people up north. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue to hire more people. In addition to that, since Arviat, um, so now yet it's about a population of 1200. And with Arviat, it's two domes, which means it's going to need more people and more. And the population is significantly larger. So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Any other questions? questions? Monica, my name is Nick. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I just had a quick question for you about barriers to adopting these types of systems. Um, my research takes place in Labrador, northern Labrador where we see a lot of the same issues, food insecurity, dependence on diesel fuel, and these, these greenhouse systems and Arctic wind turbines and Arctic solar panels, in theory, they're a great benefit yeah. with tons of potential upside. But we see a lot of resistance from policymakers to pursue this kind of thing. And the most common reframe we hear from them is, well, there's already a food system. There's already an electricity system. Why do we have to do anything else? So my question for you would be, have you encountered any type of this resistance? And what type of things can we do to kind of move the needle forward? You know? So at the moment, um, with this project, I haven't noticed because we're we Ben actually was in Faroe Islands working with um, I forgot the university, but um, they are really keen. So at the moment, we're we're so we've been talking to people outside of North America who are more involved in integrating food systems and um, sustainable energy. Um, I, I study sustainability and energy, so I understand how policymakers are particularly reluctant. But uh, I know that with us in our sustainability, like we really believe in sustainability, it's one of our mandates, but we really try to encourage green technology. That's one of our next stepping stones when we moving towards sustainability as an organization. I mean, I work for Go Transit for the electrification, so <laughs> I know that some people are reluctant when regarding <laughs> switching from diesel. <laughs> Yep. Have you guys engaged with policymakers at all or had them approach you with sort of interest in what you're doing? Um, I think it's the Trudeau Foundation, um, Paul Martin's daughter. So she particularly is interested in working with the education side, so what we so institutionalizing that education. Because um, at the moment, um, what our cooperative program is that it's a course where you kind of gain credit and um, you kind of volunteer in the greenhouse. So just kind of getting the children excited about working in the greenhouse, as well as um, we've had connections with um, the what is it called the the Nunavut strategy. It's the um, it's that subsidized um, 
program that the Canadian government has with shipping food up. I forgot what it was called. It's this one policy. But yes, we have been involved with the many policymakers as we're fortunate enough no, to uh, be situated in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the sort of the size of the dome uh, and why it is the size it is. If there's a sort of more, uh, have you done like a study on what might be a more optimal size? Is it like, do you sort of get better um, returns in sort of the efficiency of heating it and cooling it if it's larger or smaller? Well, it is Passive House certified, so I know that's why um, one of the main things was that it was, it is energy efficient, I know that. And there is a pond, <laughs> but it's, I know it has something to do with the surface area. This is more of like a Ben question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. Hey, I, I, that's all right if you don't. So, <laughs> the last minute, so that's cool. <laughs> Monica, I have a quick question for you, and uh, I actually got this question from one of our graduate students, that when it comes to harsh uh, weather conditions in Nunavut, mm -hmm. uh, what are the three top food types that are most convenient to grow in a greenhouse? Interesting. Um, well, just overall, from my knowledge of agrotechnology, leafy greens such as spinach um, and lettuce are extremely easy to grow. Yeah, just for maintaining pH. Um, as for, yeah, just I, leafy greens have always been, ask anyone, it's most easiest to grow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's easy to maintain overall. I saw that they were doing like some aquaponics with fish as well as chickens. Are, are you doing that in the north or is this where you hope to move? Um, growing north, we don't do it only because um, we don't believe it's to be culturally appropriate. Um, we do have a pond in this geodesic greenhouse, but it's uh, we, as an organization, especially from Toronto, we understand our limitations and we know we're not looking to overstep. <laughs> you know, we really want to partner with the community and work with them and what they want. So what's the pond for? Is it like a thermal battery? Exactly, yeah. And another question which I discussed with uh, Ben over the phone, but you guys are not actively looking into geothermal because of the ground characteristics, if I'm not mistaken. Some, I remember I was on that call, yes, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Questions? I guess all good. Monica, thank you so much for uh, replacing Ben uh, for us and saving this uh, saving the day. <laughs> and uh, I apologize to everybody here in the room uh, for the last minute change. Ben is really not feeling well at the moment. But thank you for supporting the Vice Public Talk and thank you for your time. Uh, have a great day. And Monica, thank you so much.